All right. Awesome. You did great. So let's just say a quick prayer before we get into this. And um, Gio, if you could just pay attention to the um, to the chats as well, just in case any questions come in. And if, um, uh, you know, if people are trying to get into the meeting, feel free to just let them in. Um, but all right. Say a quick prayer. Father God, thank you so much for connecting us with our brothers and sisters from around the world. Uh, thank you so much for allowing us the time and the space to be able to do this. Thank you for this message that I read so clearly through your word of forgiveness. And I know that there's people who struggle with the ability to forgive. They struggle with realizing that they are forgiven. Mm -hmm. And because of those two things, they struggle to share forgiveness with others and, and mm -hmm. share the forgiveness through Jesus Christ with others. And we're praying that through this discussion and through the study of your word that you work in these areas of their lives and you work in my life as well to soften our hearts and open us up to experience what it truly means to, to rest in your grace and to be able to share that with others. We're praying that anyone who tunes into this, whether now or on a playback, we're praying that they get to know you a little bit more. We're praying that if they are brothers and sisters in Christ, that they will grow a deeper understanding of your word. We're praying that if they are not believers, that through this discussion, they will at least be open to hearing the gospel and they'll at least wrestle with it and compare it to other worldviews. And we know that when they do that and when anyone does that, they come to realize that you are the truth and that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. We're praying that you are glorified in this discussion, and we're praying that the Wi-Fi works well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you. All right, guys, just going to ask you to mute yourselves until, um, you know, questions pop up and stuff like that. So let me just pull up my notes over here. All right. So let me just drink some water. I'm going to try and make it through the whole thing without drinking any more. But um, so uh, forgiveness is something that I really, really, really struggled with for like 30 years of my life. Um, and I was like the, the grudge holding king. I had I had this chip on my shoulder. I'm telling you, you could uh, you could YouTube or, or Google search my old stuff and I will pop up on like interviews I did when I was a rapper. I was an angry dude. I had a chip on my shoulder. I wore it like a badge of honor and unforgiveness was kind of, it was kind of part of my, um, part of my identity in a way. So yeah, I, I kind of, um, I lived in this realm of unforgiveness. It, it was the norm and I was surrounded by people who lived like this as well. Uh, when somebody, you know, when I was running with, with this crowd of people, when somebody did any one of us wrong, it wasn't just that we held a grudge, but we did our best to find a way to get back at them. Like, that's just how we lived. And this is how almost everyone around me viewed life uh, to one extent or, or another. Now, I was so vengeful and... Like I was so good at holding grudges that I could keep a mental list of everything that somebody did to me, quote unquote, did to me, right? From something as simple as not showing up for one of my shows when I was a rapper or to other things that actually people in the world would consider me to be justified in my unforgiveness. Like when I was sexually abused when I was a kid, people would say that I would be justified in never forgiving that person. And what's interesting is, you know, the world is always speaking about forgiveness. It, they give forgiveness lip service and it pretends to be a forgiving place, but we know that it's not. And there are limits to how much most people are willing to forgive. Uh, in fact, there are even circumstances in which if someone finds out that you forgave somebody that they deem unforgivable, they now, in their mind, believe they have a reason and justification to hold a grudge against you. Like, let's just think about how crazy this is. People will get mad at you for forgiving someone else. And then they'll go harbor unforgiveness towards you because in their minds, you have wronged them by forgiving someone else. 
us as humans, we need help. Okay, we need help. And this is why when it comes to the topic of forgiveness or or really any moral topic for that matter, we have to search for a standard above our own. If the standard of when, who, or how to forgive someone is left up to us, then those standards change from person to person. And th this creates an absolute mess. And I used to live all up in this kind of mess. And if we're being honest with ourselves and with everyone here, we have either been a part of this mess in the past, or we are currently living in this mess of unforgiveness right now. So although I'm not opposed to it, my goal for tonight's study isn't to have like some miraculous breakthrough and super transformational moment or, or anything like that. That would be awesome if that happens, but that's that's not my goal for, for this discussion. I just simply want to get us all thinking and viewing the when, who, and how of forgiveness that isn't drawn up by some human mind, but is given to us directly from the mind of God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in his word, in his word. So before we get into forgiving others and before we get into how that plays out in our lives, I wanna first discuss our forgiveness in Christ because it, it's so important. It's the most important aspect of forgiveness. It, it comes by first recognizing that one, we are in need of forgiveness <clears throat> because we can't seek forgiveness if we don't believe we've done anything wrong. And then two, accepting that we are forgiven. So uh, to jump into some scripture, um, you guys don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but it's Romans chapter three. I'm just going to be reading it. Uh, there are some scriptures where I will want you to, to break out the Bible and we'll read it together. But um, you know, first, Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and fall short to the glory of God. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Ecclesiastes 7.20, indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is completely right. It's important to realize and recognize how short we fall. If we're honest with ourselves, we don't even live up to the standards we set for ourselves. We definitely don't live up to the standards that other people place on us, and it would be impossible to live up to God's standards. So, the reason we don't live up to our own standards uh, is for a few things. Um, one is, you know, we're, we're selfish. We can also be self-deluded, angry, vengeful, stubborn. I'm speaking about myself, but maybe you guys can relate. Um, and we often allow our emotions to dictate our actions. And in doing so, we fall short of our own ideals, let alone other people's or God's. So you guys can all agree that we will say one thing, and we will do another. And it may be with little things, but any time that we do that, we are a hypocrite and we are not living up to the standards that we set for ourselves and others. Well, many times we will point out the flaws in somebody else, and then we'll go end up doing the same thing that they did that caused us to point that out to them, right? Now, when it comes to other people, we, we don't live up to their standards for a few reasons. One being other people expect us to live up to their own personal standard of morality that they themselves fail to live up to in the same way that we do, right? But other times, we have just let others down due to our failures as just being simple, fallen human beings. I'm sure if we all right now take a few moments to think about it, we... We can remember times where we let somebody down and we may not have meant to let, let them down, mean to let them down, but we did. And therefore we fall short of, the, and we could have even painted the expectation for them. Like, yeah, I'm going to be there 100%. You can count on me. And then we fail them. So we fail all the time and we are definitely never going to live up to God's standards simply because it's impossible to do so. He is perfect. And even though in our self-delusion, we can trick ourselves into thinking that we are perfect, 
we can definitely do that. We, deep down inside, we know that we aren't. Even the most arrogant person that you talk to who you would look at them and you'd say, man, this person really thinks he walks on water. This person thinks he does no wrong. Deep down inside, they know that they're not perfect. And many times that arrogance is just a mask that they wear to cover up their insecurities. So again, as I said earlier, we need help, right? Like Humans need help. And that help arrived in the form of the Son of God, putting on human flesh, living the sinless, perfect life that you and I couldn't live, facing the punishment that we all deserve to face, fully satisfying the wrath of God, forgiving us for all of our sins. Then he rose again from death, conquering the grave so that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We as individually, we as individuals and corporately have sinned against a holy God. We have violated his commands, and it only takes one violation to keep us out of his kingdom. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the entire law, yet stumbles at one point, is guilty of breaking it all. He goes on to say, For he who said, talking about God, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. Now, I know I'm starting off just a tad bit heavy, <laughs> but I think it's important. Uh, it's good to reflect on how short we all fall. And it's important to realize how imperfect we are. And it's necessary to recognize how easily we can be swayed towards sin. And we'll circle back to this when we discuss what the Bible says about forgiving others. But before we do that, let me just jump into the good news to kind of uh, bring this back up because we were really, really heavy there for, for a minute. So although the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life. And all of us who receive that gift through Jesus Christ, we pass from death to life. We move from receiving what we have earned, because that's what wages are. We move from receiving what we have earned into receiving what we could never earn. And I would just like us to turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, real quick, if we could. I'll give you a minute to get there. Because this, this is one of my friend Daryl's uh, favorite scriptures, but... These passages right here, they embody the joy that we should all have and understanding that we should all have when it comes to how we are forgiven in Christ. So I'm going to read this real quick. All right. So this is Romans chapter eight. Are you guys there? You guys good? All right. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, my man, Daryl just got in here. I was literally, Daryl shows up when I'm talking about his favorite scripture, right? So let's get into it. Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Those words right there, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This right here is, hold on, um, I got to pause real quick. Somebody's asking, uh, I'm pretty sure Gio has like baby in one hand. Um Gio, if you're on, if you could let uh, Mylene, Mylene into yes. the, oh, you're in. Oh, boom, you're in. Awesome. Thank you, Gio. Appreciate you. Sorry, I just noticed it right there. I totally, uh, I, ha I think I have undiagnosed ADHD, so excuse me for that. But the reason why I, I love this verse, the, this scripture, is just how it starts, right? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. This is important for you to know. 
that if you are in Christ, this means that you are always, listen to me, always in right standing with God. We may fall short in the flesh, and we will always fall short in the flesh, but in the spirit, we are fully righteous in his eyes. John chapter 1, verse 29, this is John the Baptist speaking about Jesus. He says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus took your sins away, meaning they are gone. They don't pop up like every now and then like, you're, what's up? It's me, your sin. Like that's, that's not how it goes, okay? No, in God's eyes, they are as far away from him as the east is to the west, meaning they are infinitely gone. So always remember this when you fall short because you will. Always remember that you are righteous in the eyes of God. And sometimes the guilt that we have done in the past, and this happens to me as well, it weighs on us. And I would argue that sometimes this can be a healthy reminder of what God has done for us. And we can remember how far he has taken us, but we're not to dwell on these things and let them weigh us down. Because if we've been forgiven much, we should love much. Now, this next section I wanna get into is, is it possible to forgive ourselves? That's something I want to wrestle with um, in the scriptures. But if up to this point you have any questions about what was just said, um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, Gio can unmute you and then you can ask them. But if not, just give me the thumbs up and I'll keep going. Awesome. I will keep going. All right, so is it possible to forgive ourselves? Now, we are never instructed in the Bible to forgive ourselves. We're not. And I believe that it's not in there because it's an impossible thing to do. Now, we're instructed to remember how forgiven we already are by God. And if God has forgiven us, there's no need for us to walk around with our heads down to the ground, miserable and anxious about the things we cannot change and the things that we cannot control. But it's impossible to forgive yourself. So I think one of the most dangerous teachings out there, and it sounds good, but it's not, right? Uh, and you'll find it a lot in the personal growth space, the self-help, the... Um, uh, the, the New Age talks about this a lot, and it's about forgiving yourself. And I think that this is a, it, it's an endless process because it's impossible. And you'll see many times people who are in this, this worldview and in that frame of thought, they're always healing but never healed. They're always searching to forgive themselves. And the reason that you find it so difficult to forgive yourself is because you can't. It's impossible. If it were possible, God would have instructed us to do so. So release yourself from the burden of trying to forgive yourself, but always remember how forgiven you are in Christ. Now, there's many things in my past, and I'm sure in, in yours as well, that I've done to others. I, I've done them to myself. And more importantly, I've sinned against God. And that sometimes pops back in my head and I instantly feel guilty all over again. You know, I, I have a, a shady past. I've, I've hurt many people in my life. And as much as I wish I, I could turn back the hands of time, I can't change the things that I've done. I can't, I can't, and neither can you. So you have to come to that realization that your past is your past. And if God is willing to remove it as far as the East is from the West, then remove it from yourself as well. I think it's, as I said earlier, it's important to have a healthy reminder of how far God has brought you. And you'll be 10 years down the line, looking back at this moment, saying, wow, I, I was a crazy person. I, I can't believe how far God has taken me. And, and you're already a believer right now. So whenever this happens to you or whenever this happens to me and things pop up in my head, I, I just try to remind myself about my right standing with God. And I think... I thank him for saving a sinner like me. And so just, I would implore you guys that when you find yourself spiraling down these things, when you find yourself weighed down by your past or the anxiety of the future, just take the burdens off your shoulders. And as Matthew 11, 
uh, verse 28 says, just lay them at the foot of the cross. Rest in his forgiveness. And when I feel like it's such a burden off of um, my shoulders when I realized that I could not forgive myself because it's impossible. And it, it was more of a, a burden lifted off when I realized that I didn't need to because I was already forgiven by God. So now we're going to move on to forgiving others and seeking forgiveness. But before I do, is there any questions, comments, concerns before I move forward? Just so you know, I kind of use that as an excuse for me to drink my water. All right, awesome. I'm going to continue. And you could always type the questions in the chat. Um, Gio will collect them later as well. Um, so forgiving others and seeking forgiveness. So uh, I want to turn to, give me one second. I didn't write the scripture here. Praise God for online. All right. We are going to flip to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Oh, I went too far. Matthew is the, it's the first gospel in the New Testament, just in case. You're struggling to get there like I am right now. So I want to read this to you because there is so much in here, so much that we can take. All right, I'm almost there, almost there. So this is chapter 18, verse 21 starting in verse 21, and we're going to read all the way to verse 35, all right? So be patient. And as you read this, right, as we're reading this, think about what Jesus was trying to, um, trying to display here, trying to convey, display, what, convey, display, trying to convey here, right? Not trying, because Jesus don't try to do anything. He conveys his message. But just read this, and then we're going to break it down. Uh, so, so then Peter approached him, meaning Peter approached Jesus, asking, he asked the Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? This is Jesus. I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Now look, pause. This doesn't mean you start counting, all right, I forgive him seven, now I got to do that time 70, and then after that, I don't got to forgive him. That's not what Jesus is doing. It's hyperbole right here, okay? So verse 23, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay me what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers. 
<laughs> sorry, I heard some handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. So this is some heavy stuff right here. And this lays out uh, a good foundation of what forgiveness looks like. Now we could go to a whole bunch of other uh, passages and everything. Um, but the reason why I wanted to start with recognizing how much we have been forgiven wasn't only to put into perspective how joyful it is to be in Christ, but also as a foundation for when it comes to forgiving others. If we, whoa, echo. Um, if we look at this parable, we see that the servant was forgiven of so much. And instead of paying that forgiveness forward, he held it, he held over one of his fellow servants' head the debt that was owed to him. And instead of forgiving him of that debt, he held it over him and he put him in jail. This is what it's like, and I'm not trying to eisegete uh, this text, all right? That's not what I'm saying here. But this is what it's like when you hold a grudge, guys. You are being the ungrateful servant. God has forgiven us of so much. Who are we to hold a grudge against somebody else when the creator of the universe who suffered in our place for our forgiveness doesn't hold anything against us? We didn't deserve the forgiveness that we've received, yet we think we're justified to withhold forgiveness from others. Think about this, guys. We are going to constantly fall short of the glory of God. We are going to constantly sin against a holy God, and yet He doesn't count them towards us. We are to do the same. So I just want to read a few scriptures here, right? We have Ephesians. You don't have to flip to them. I'm just going to read them. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be, I'm reading this so we can get an idea for where we're going, right? Uh, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Then we have Colossians 3.13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Then we have Matthew 18, verses 21 through 22. We just read this. Peter approached him asking, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Guys, these aren't suggestions. These aren't instructions. These are commands. We are commanded to forgive. We aren't only told to forgive when we feel like it or when we get over it or when the person is seeking forgiveness or when we bump into the person. No, we are told and commanded to forgive, period. Period. Is that, that's what the kids are saying nowadays. Period. All right. So have you ever had forgiveness withheld from you? If you have ever had forgiveness withheld from you, meaning you sought forgiveness from somebody else and they rejected it, you know the pain that it can cause you. You know how much it hurts to be rejected when you seek forgiveness and somebody just doesn't do it. Right now, I have somebody that I love who hasn't forgiven me for the person that I was when I was a teenager and in, in my early 20s. I'm obviously no longer that person, but this person whom I really love, I've sought time and time again, sought forgiveness from this person and only to be met with silence over and over again. And I tell you guys, there's nothing louder than the silence of someone whom you are seeking forgiveness from. And we as Christians, we are not allowed, we cannot willingly, purposefully, inflict this kind of pain on people who are seeking forgiveness from us. We can't. We're told to be unique in our ability to forgive, even the most egregious of offenses. 
uh, just recently, and Paul, you know I was going to bring this up, but um, Bishop Mar Mari Emmanuel. Um, I don't suggest following his theology, but um, his example he that he just set, he was, uh, maybe you guys have seen it on the news, but he was stabbed yeah. while he was preaching, right? Um, a an is, Islamic extremist, walked right down the middle of his church, pulled out a knife and tried to tried to stab him and did stab him a few times. When his congregation subdued this man and they had him pinned down on the floor, the bishop went down, put his hand on the man's head and prayed for him. When he took some time to recover and he went and uh, he preached again, he preached forgiveness. He preached that he prayed that the man would come to repentance. He prayed and said that he loves this man. And we're called to love our enemies. And I think that this is such an example of what, um, what the Holy Spirit does to somebody and in their walk with Christ. It's such an example of the gospel's transformative power in somebody's life to be attacked. And then moments after you're attacked, you're praying for the person. We look at Jesus as our example, you know, when he was being crucified and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus, he could have called legions of angels from heaven to come and take him off of that cross. But instead he asked for their forgiveness. So one of the most difficult things that I ever had to do was to forgive the person who sexually abused me when I was a child. I held this anger inside of me until I was in my early 30s. And when I finally started taking God's word more seriously, I came to the realization in reading God's word that I need to forgive this person. So I asked God for help. I asked, I said, God, help help me forgive him. I don't know if I can. I searched for him in the past so I could confront him in a different kind of way. And uh, when I came to the realization that I needed to forgive him, I found him. I reached out to him. I, I sent him a message. I never got a response. Um, and maybe that's good that I never got a response. But either way, it was tough to just reach out. And long story short, forgiving him even though he never responded, it was a huge weight lifted off of my shoulders. I, I can't explain it to you guys, uh, this, this anger and hatred that I held inside of me. And I, I thought that I was justified in doing so because of what he did to me. This is, this is something that anyone, even the most vile of sinners out there in the world, looks at what, what this man would do to a child, would look at that as, yeah, that's unforgivable. And so... I felt justified. And I know that, you know, I'm telling that story not to like make this about me, but I just know that there's some of you who may be listening to this right now or maybe on the playback, you just feel like you can't forgive somebody who has done you wrong. But you have to remember, guys, this isn't our choice. We are commanded to forgive. Now, let's just, just reason with me real quick, right? Does God ever command us to do something that isn't good for us and others? I, I hope you know the answer to that is no, but let's check the scripture just to find out, right? Psalm 19 verses 7 through 8, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. And I can, I can attest to that last part, making the eyes light up. I had this like hatred in my eyes and this anger in my eyes. And I can see the difference in, in my life after I released that. So, uh, if we are to take God at his word, and we know that God commands us to forgive, and we, we also know through scripture that God never commands us to do anything that will not benefit us and others in the long run, then why do we choose to hold on to grudges? Why do we do so? 
So in my opinion, it comes down to two things. One is pride, and the other is lack of trust in God. Both forgiving and seeking forgiveness, both of those things take humility. It can be extremely embarrassing even to even attempt to have that conversation. When I, um, one of my family members that we had a lot of issues when I was growing up and you know I sought out reconciliation and forgiveness, that conversation was awkward and embarrassing. I had to let them, you know, when I sought forgiveness from them, I had to let them unload a lot on me and just sit there and take it. That was uncomfortable, guys, super uncomfortable. But just because something's uncomfortable doesn't mean that we have a right to not go do it, guys. Like, we have to be different. We can't cower in the face of seeking forgiveness or forgiving somebody. We can't be cowards. We just can't, guys. Now, as far as the second reason why we hold grudges of, of not trusting God, uh, it sometimes may look like this, right? We think that if we seek forgiveness or if we forgive someone, that our lives might be worse off than they were before we took these steps or the uncomfortable conversation or the embarrassment of getting shot down will affect us in the long run. And now we'll have to live with the disappointment of not being forgiving, not being forgiven after seeking it. That's it's a real thing, guys. These are, I'm not trying to dismiss these emotions and these uncomfortabilities that come with seeking forgiveness and, and forgiving others. These are real things. But again, we're not to cower at these things. We are more than conquerors in Christ, guys. So as someone who's been shot down myself, <laughs> when I have sought forgiveness from people, the action of seeking forgiveness left me with a clear conscience, right? Not a clear conscience from things that I've done, but a clear conscience in, in, at least I sought it out, at least I tried. And also it taught me that uh, it could be tempting to hold a grudge against someone who has chosen to re reject your forgiveness. I was tempted, let me just grab a drink of water. But when I sought forgiveness and I would not receive, and I did not receive forgiveness and I got shot down or met with silence, I was tempted to then hold a grudge against the people who I was seeking forgiveness from. And in our in our minds, we can we can trick ourselves into thinking that we're justified. Like, oh well I sought forgiveness and they didn't give it to me. So therefore screw them. Like I'm done with them. Whatever. That's guys, that is that's not a healthy way to live. We, we have to learn that when we seek forgiveness and if we are shot down, we have to leave the door open, guys. We, we cannot shut the door behind us. We can shut the door to worrying about it. We can shut the door to having anxiety over it. We can shut the door to all of that stuff, but we don't shut the door to the person. We leave the door open for them to walk through it when they're ready. Uh, there's, there's times when I was younger and I, I look at the at how I thought when I was younger and I I probably would have reacted the same way as these people have reacted to me when I sought out forgiveness. And to I saw Daryl's question in the chat in the chat. Oh well, no, I saw Angel's question in the chat. Would you add fear to that list? The fear of being hurt again from that person? Yes, that is that is a that is a legit fear. It definitely is. And, and we're actually going to talk about that in the next section when we, are, when we talk about forgiveness and reconciliation. But um, before we jump into that, I know I just spoke for a pretty long time uh, right there. Are there any questions, comments, concerns about what we've, we've just went through right there? Nope. All right. Sounds good. We will continue moving on. When you guys don't ask questions, I feel like I'm doing a good job. So awesome. <laughs> but uh, all right. So now forgiveness and reconciliation. When it comes to forgiving others, I think one of the fears that we have is that if we forgive this person, then we open the door for them to hurt us again. Exactly what you said, Angel. And this is true. It's a, it's a legit fear to have, especially when we seek not only 
uh, to forgive someone, but to reconcile with them. Because these are two different things. I, I want to be clear on the terminology here, guys. Um, forgiveness and reconciliation, they're not the same thing. They're connected, but they're not the same thing. Forgiving someone means that you are no longer holding a grudge against them. Reconciling with someone is the act of repairing your relationship with them. Now, when we don't accept someone's apology and we do not forgive them, we are not only breaking one of God's commands, but we are also not trusting him with the outcome of obeying his commands. And we trick ourselves into thinking that our lives will be better off in disobedience. Think about that. We trick ourselves into thinking that our lives will be better off in disobedience to God. And we hold on to the fear of forgiving someone because we are used to living in unforgiveness. We're so used to living in it that we're afraid of what it looks like on the other side of forgiveness. So what I want to do is break down what forgiveness can look like, practically speaking, guys, like in real life situations, right? So forgiveness does not mean that any wrongs done to you were acceptable. All right, let's be clear on that. Forgiveness does not diminish the evil done against you, nor does, nor is it a denial of what happened. Now, this I, I took this from a Christian counseling um, portfolio. So this is from Christian counselors. This is not my words. I, I just thought it was really good stuff. Um, so forgiveness is a key part of not letting those wrongs hurt you any longer. When you forgive. It, it releases you of the hurt. And it can be a, a process, but it will release you of that hurt. Forgiveness does not take the consequences the other person will face because of his or her sin or their actions. It doesn't get them out of jail free, all right? Forgiveness is letting go of your desire to hurt the other person. Simply put, forgiveness means you cancel the debt. They don't owe you anything anymore. Forgiveness is a difficult and uncomfortable process. When you make the decision to forgive, God provides the grace and the strength to forgive and to maintain a heart of forgiveness because that's what it'll take. It'll take continuously maintaining a, a posture of forgiveness when you forgive somebody. So forgiveness is not a weakness, guys. It's not a weakness. It's the most powerful thing you can do. Refusing to forgive allows Satan to continue to hurt you. Forgiveness puts a stop to many of the destructive powers that Satan has in people's lives. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. It takes two to reconcile, but it only takes one to forgive. Forgiveness does not depend on another person's actions, and it is not probationary, for example, saying, I will forgive you as long as you're not drinking. I will forgive you as long as you don't aggravate me anymore. I will forgive you as long as you don't fill in the blank. That's not forgiveness. That's conditional forgiveness. Now, forgiveness also doesn't require you to become a doormat, nor does it require you to allow the offender to hurt you again. So we can place boundaries from that for happening, right? Forgiveness does not wait for the offender to repent. I need you guys to hear this one more time. I need to take a drink right here. Forgiveness does not wait for the offender to repent. Forgiveness is about how much you trust God to take care of you. Forgiveness is experiencing empathy for the offender, humility about your own sinfulness and a gratitude for being forgiven by God and others. And there was this quote by, I'm going to mess up the guy's name, but Frank Minerth. I do not know who this guy is or his theology. I just saw it on the page and I like it. it says, human power alone is not sufficient to reach full forgiveness. There is an element of forgiveness that is divine. It cannot be reached without God. So lean on God to help you forgive. Now, before we move on to uh, reconciliation, um, is there any questions about that list that I just went through or anything that popped into your head that you want to say about that list that I just went through? Mm, thumbs up. Awesome. It, I'm either doing a really good job or you guys are really, or, or you guys are really shy. So, <laughs> all right. So let's, 
let's touch on reconciliation. Now, biblically, we are to seek reconciliation if possible, right? Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So this is what, quote unquote, if possible, this is what it, this is what it looks like, all right? So if possible implies that reconciliation should be sought if the circumstances and conditions allow for a genuine, listen to that word, a genuine resolution and a genuine restoration of the relationship without compromising your personal safety, your dignity, or your Christian values. It involves both parties, both parties, being willing to work towards rebuilding the relationship. Reconciliation sets boundaries, guys. You can set boundaries. You don't have to, um, reconciling with someone doesn't mean that you immediately and completely restore them to the place that they held in your life before they had wronged you. If they are sincere about rebuilding the relationship and they're sincere about reconciling, they will understand the boundaries that you have placed. There are some people in my life that I have reconciled with, but they have permanent boundaries. And I've reconciled with them and I've placed those boundaries, yes, to protect myself, but also because I love them and I want to continue to have a relationship with them. And if I don't have that boundary there, then they'll cross the line and, and things get all crazy again. And then we have to go through the whole entire, it's, it's just having boundaries is so important. There's a book that I will suggest to you guys. It's called Boundaries. I believe it's by Dr. Henry Cloud. I'm sorry if that's not by him, but it's boundaries. If you search it on Amazon, it's got a pencil on it, drawing a, bound, a boundary line. Um, if in the playback of this on YouTube, I'll, I'll put it in the description. It's an incredible book, absolutely incredible book. So I would ask just, um, is there anyone in your life that you have to reconcile with? Just think about it right now. Probably the first person who popped in your head. Is there anyone in life that you may have reconciled with, but you had to place boundaries? Is there anyone in your life that you want to forgive, but you don't want to follow through because you feel that reconciliation is, is impossible? So just sit on that for a second. You know, th Think about it. Are there people out there that you have to reconcile with? Are there people out there that your friends now that you have reconciled with? There's people that I've reconciled with that I'm so glad that we got through the whole messiness of reconciling and we got through the, the craziness of having to have the, I forgive you, you forgive give me, let's work on our relationship conversation. Man, I am so joyful and happy that I went through that mess with some people because now they're part of my life. They're part of my family's life. They're part of... Uh, you know, they get to be part of um, my my new baby's, uh, me and Gio's new baby's life. Like we, it's so much more joyful. And the these people's presence in our lives now adds value because we've reconciled, we've set boundaries and we've put the past behind us. And it, it's beautiful to do that. So um, now in the scenario we're about to look at, right? Because we're going to get into reconciliation and what that looks like, right? In the scenario we're about to look at, this passage that we're going to go through, we're going to Matthew 18 again, right? Um, this is specifically within a church community and specifically about dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I do believe that we can take some of the principles found in Jesus's words here and apply them to our daily walk as well, without getting confused and, and placing ourselves into the text. But there are principles in here that are valuable. So let's flip over to Matthew chapter 18. We're only going to read two verses, uh, 15, three verses, 15 through 17. So if you'll flip over there right now, this is under, um, you'll see if you have the, the Bible that I've um, suggested for these Bible studies, you'll see it's, it's, you'll see the title, it says Restoring a Brother. So well, let me just move this right here. I think my camera just shut off. Are we good? No, we are good to go. All right. 
So it says, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. Verse 17, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention to even the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Meaning, uh, meaning, Forgiving someone doesn't, uh, hold up, I lost my spot. Meaning this, guys, you are to seek forgiveness. You are to, oh, somebody said, what was that? That was Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, right? So although this is specifically for the church, right? Specifically between your brothers and sisters in Christ, there is still a formula here, Right? So you come to them first. If they won't listen, then you bring other people. You kind of like have an intervention, I guess you could say. You have people discuss it with them. Then you bring it to the church. You have you, you try to reconcile this. You try to get them to repent if they've done you wrong. You try to do all of this. Then if they're just not willing to have it, it says treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. Just so you understand in the Jewish uh, biblical framework that that is set in and in that time period, that means that you do not associate with them at all anymore. Right. So the man who uh, sexually abused me when I was younger, um, just because I forgave him, that doesn't mean it would be a good idea for me to sec re seek reconciliation with him. If I'm ever given the chance to see him face to face, it would only be to let him know that I forgive him and that he needs to seek help and forgiveness from the Lord. I would also warn him that against continuing in that kind of behavior. And if I suspected he was continuing in that kind of behavior, I would, I would go to the authorities. But forgiving someone doesn't mean that we allow them to put us or others in danger. Guys, it just doesn't. All throughout scripture, we see warnings to cut ties with dangerous people. We are to love them, pray for them, pray that they'll repent and seek the Lord, but we are not commanded to keep them in our lives. I know this is like, this is happy for the cut you off people right here. Um, but I just want to read this story. I do not know if it's true. It popped up on my timeline, but either way, the story is crazy, right? So it's, it's just quick. It's got a little link right here, but it says, woman forgives her mother's killer and visits him in prison. Upon release, she gives him a job working at the house where he killed her mother. He murders her in the same house. This, you needed some discernment, lady. You needed some discernment. I don't know if that story is true. It might be true, might not be true, but the principle is there. This person murdered your mother. You went to visit him in prison. You forgave him. This is obviously a dangerous person. You do not give him a job in your mother's house. You don't do that. You don't seek reconciliation with a violent person. You don't do this. So... I think that we get this confused sometimes that forgiveness always has to end in the relationship being reconciled. So let's let's just go to scripture real quick. We have Proverbs 22 verses 24 and through 25. Do not make friends with an angry person and do not be a companion of a hot-tempered one or you will learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. Then we have 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived. This is one of my favorites. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals or it corrupts good character. Then we have 2 Timothy verses, uh, 2 Timothy number, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But know this, hard time, and this is so important because this is talking about the last days, right? The time that I believe we are living in right now. But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, listen to irreconcilable, 
slanderers without self-control, brutal without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. That key word in there, irreconcilable. There's going to be people that you just, you're not going to reconcile with. Now, although there are people who are irreconcilable, Although there are people who are dangerous, although there are people who have hurt us and, and, and we got to keep them away from us even when we forgive us, although we are to avoid these kind of people, we have to ask ourselves, what is God's heart for people? And before we get into that, uh, this will be our, our final section. Do you guys have any questions about what we went through? Because I know that this is, this is important. Um, to, to know you can be free from thinking that you need to reconcile with people who are just dangerous for you or not good. They're just not good people. They're, they're not seeking the Lord. They're people who that if you let them back in your life, they're going to hurt you again. It's the pattern of destruction follows them wherever they go. You're not called to reconcile with them. You are called to forgive them but you're not called to reconcile with them. Yeah, I think most people are, some people actually mistake that for true forgiveness. That's not what true forgiveness is. I mean, um, uh, you know, basically, I would say true forgiveness is uh, just don't pay evil onto evil. Pay right. good onto evil. You know, pay good. And that's what it's, uh, that's why I, that's why Jesus actually commanded us to forgive because, we don't want to stoop ourselves down to their to the levels of those who have wronged us you know and and of and of course we have to remember god is not just god of love he is the god of just justice right. so right that's why so, yep, i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off paul no oh, but that's why you know we're told to not seek vengeance vengeance is of the lords you know, the, the Lord is our avenger in a sense, right? Give him a Captain America shield. Good to go, right? Um, so, all right. Uh, is there anything else or will I continue into this last section? All right, cool. All right. So now I'm going to ask the question again. You know, although we're to avoid these people, we, we still have to ask ourselves, what is God's heart for these people? And that brings us to the ministry of reconciliation. We have 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Then we have 2 Peter verses three, uh, chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, <laughs> not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. It's clear in Scripture that God wants all to be saved. Does this mean that all will be saved? Definitely not. But when God forgives, God's forgiveness comes with reconciliation. It's a, it's a package deal, guys. It comes with reconciliation. And you and I are ministers of that reconciliation. So let me just read to you. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Now, everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I, I just want to read it again so this can seep into you. This is a verse that like, you want seared into your mind because Paul is speaking about part of what our job here is on this planet. Now, everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, and since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He is making his appeal through us. So, we've received from God the ministry of reconciliation, which involves proclamation and demonstration of God's reconciliation with humanity through Jesus Christ, meaning we are to tell people about the good news. God reconciled us to himself through Christ. This demonstrates God's love and forgiveness by not counting our sins against us. And we are ambassadors for Christ. We're entrusted with the task of delivering God's message of reconciliation to others, urging them to be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. So the reason we need to be aware of what forgiveness means to us as Christians is because we are ambassadors for Christ, guys. The reason it's so important for us to have our our minds wrapped around what it means to forgive, what it means to receive forgiveness, what it means to forgive others, what it means to seek reconciliation, is because the world is looking at us. When you label yourself a Christian, you say that you love Jesus, you are an ambassador for Christ, and we are to be unique. We have to be different than the grudge-holding world. So, as ministers of reconciliation and, and as ambassadors for Christ, we should be quick to forgive. We should be patient and merciful. We should be willing to reconcile when possible. And we shouldn't be holding grudges against anybody. And we should be seeking God's help. And most importantly, guys, we need to be forgiving as Christ forgave. What an honor that through the forgiveness of our sins, we can now be called ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors for Christ, and be used by the creator of the universe as his ministers of reconciliation. This is why we have to understand what we've been forgiven of so we can, so we can fully grasp that in order for us to forgive others when it's difficult. And so we can seek reconciliation when possible. And then we can be good ambassadors for Christ, leading by example and being walking ambassadors of what it means to live in the joy and the forgiveness and the rest of His grace. And when we live in this way, when we're different than everyone else, we are a light shining on the top of a mountain for the whole entire world to see, we are different. That's what the word holy means, to be different. And when we walk different than the rest of the world, when they can't fathom how you are able to forgive and reconcile with somebody that they could never imagine reconciling with, you are being an incredible ambassador for Christ. They are looking at you and saying, that person is different. And when they come to the end of their rope and they realize that all of the grudges that they've been holding have been rotting their soul from within, and they're thinking of how to rid themselves of all this anger and all this pain and all this anxiety, they're going to remember how you acted and how you forgave and how you sought reconciliation. Therefore, when you share the gospel with them, look, the gospel is the power unto salvation. When God's going to save somebody, He's going to save them. But to be a walking testament of what the transformative power of the gospel is, when you share that good news with them, they know that you're taking this walk seriously, and they know that if they put their faith in Christ, not only can they hopefully look forward to walking a better life, but they know that they have you to be there for them as well. And that's why this is so important. Now, before I close this out and open the floor to, to questions or anything, I just want to say that if you're somebody who struggles with 
forgiveness and you struggle with the ability to forgive others, I get it. There is no shame in seeking help, like seeking professional help, guys. There are good Christian counselors out there. Um, I'll post uh, a link to um, from where I grabbed this article from. I'll post a link to that where they uh, they give you a list of different Christian counselors that you can contact. Um, there's no shame in getting help because when you get help and and God uses good Christian counseling and good counsel, you see in scripture all the time uh, to seek good counsel. When he uses that to help release you of unforgiveness, you can be used for the kingdom so much more. So with that being said, I believe that ends our lesson. I think this is one of the longest ones that I've, that I've done. So any questions, comments, concerns, any stories? Oh, I see uh, Daryl's holding his, uh, uh, my love, if you could pass the host back over to me, I would appreciate it. Dow, you might be able to just unmute yourself. Hey, bro. Yeah, bro. Brother, it was good, man. I, I appreciate um, the lesson tonight. It was a good reminder of, you know, like I, I came in, like you said, on Romans 8 1. <laughs> you know, it's a good, it's a good reminder that like we as Christians, we're we're completely forgiven of all our sin. And it's like, you know, uh, especially for those that are like written with, with guilt and they're like, how can God forgive me? How can God love someone that did whatever X, Y, Z that I'd done? Like for that Christian that, you know, believes that and that struggles with that. Yeah, that's real. People struggle with guilt, but you really have to just continue to run to the cross and really know, like really believe God's promises. Like that promise is yours in Christ Jesus. You're not condemned. You are loved. You're, 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 you're secure in Christ. Like all, all, all your sins are gone. It, you know, like when Christ died, all your sins went in the future anyway. So it's like all your sins are gone. And you know, when you know that you're forgiven by God, it will help you continue to forgive others. Um, and, you know, John just had a good, powerful testimony that he shared about, you know, forgiving his 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 offender. And we we all have people that like grievously sin against us or that continue to sin against us. And like what, what John talked about, reconciliation and forgiveness, two separate things. Absolutely. Um, so, brother, thank you. It was it was just a good reminder of everything uh, tonight. So thank you very much. God bless you, Daryl. And if you guys have not checked out Daryl's channel on YouTube, he's got a fire, fire channel as well. He does a lot of, uh, he interviews a lot of people. It's really, really dope. He has some deep theological conversations too, if you're into that stuff, which you should be. Ooh, may I ask a question? Yeah, go for it, Carla. Daryl, what is your um, YouTube domain? How can we find you? Hold on, let me, Darryl, oh, yeah. post it in the chat. Post yeah, I'll chat. post it in the chat, and I'm on also on the Why Jesus Network with John. So sometimes you might have seen me uh, with uh, him on the Why Jesus Network. But yeah, I'll post it in the chat for everybody. Right, and I'll definitely put it in the um, in my YouTube description when I upload this. Okay, thank you. Awkward silence. No. <laughs> Awesome. Well, if there's no more questions, um, I just want to say again, thank you so much for being on here. Um, next week, we're getting right back into going verse by verse through Mark. Definitely invite friends. If you're if you're just tuning in for the first time, you can also catch all of the all of the past. Um, I don't know what week we're on, but you could go check all of the past um, Bible studies that we did as a group to catch up to where we're at. Um, throw it on at the gym and and just zone out and listen. Um, but yeah, that being said, guys, I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm going to say a quick prayer and we will get out of here. Oh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, like, share, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff. Also, if you want to support the channel, become a Patreon supporter. I will put it in the link description below. That helps me buy diapers for the baby. So thank you. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just subscribe to you. I just subscribed your channel. Oh yeah. Oh, Daryl. Daryl. Awesome.
Yeah, that was cool, people. Mm. All right, guys, just going to stop the recording. And then where do I do that? Boom, there. And I'm going to say a quick prayer. And I'm going to go upstairs and hopefully see this baby before he goes to sleep.